On April 26, director Mickey Huff and filmmakers Doug Hecker and Christopher Oscar presented their latest documentary, Project Censored the Movie, at the Aquas Cafe in Petaluma, California. The local residents then had the opportunity to join in a group discussion about corporate-operated news and media. Wonderful film. It's the second time I saw it. I will buy a copy. We're going to share it with all of our Grange members. Anybody that wants to watch it over there. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I think it's very brave and bold, and I, I encourage braveness and boldness on all of our parts. The other thing that, that I'd love to see addressed in film is what's just beginning to emerge. We've got climate crisis. It's awful. How many millions of people don't have food and water? And none of our cultures are ready to accept people who are in desperate situations. So you guys are showing some incredible tools that we need to use better. That's my yeah, Thank you, Tom. Thinking about different people I know socially or that I work with that I would like them to see something like this. I would like to be able to discuss these topics with them. But I find there's so many people with blinders on, you know, they want to avoid cognitive dissonance. They want to avoid having their paradigm challenged. They, um, they're very comfortable in their ignorance. And I, I would like ways in which to try to break through that, that barrier. Thank you. Um, we have uh, information on our website at projectcensored.org that are, of course I think this film is a nice icebreaker and there's a, a shorter version of it as well. Um, and you can talk to Doug and Chris about that. Um, we also have things like five ways to flex your media literacy muscles and sort of downloads and things like that to just get people thinking about the medium you know, where people get information. And you can kind of get people thinking about that. Anything you can do to plant the seed to have people begin to critique or analyze what they're seeing and hearing, right? And, and sometimes the rest of it kind of just takes its own form. It takes on its own life. Um, and to what you were saying, um, and uh, hats off to Oliver H. Kelly, 1867, the found, founder of the Grange. <laughs> the Grange. Um, uh, really important work happening there. And I, I want to at least, I want to give full respect to what we find, and I know sometimes we use the word tool in, as a pejorative in our culture, um, but as far as what we see as educators, as the tools of, of, of real serious change of the future, there, there are our students. And um, you got to see a lot of the students in the film, and we work with so many, we work with hundreds a year on our book, and that's really why we do this, is um, so many of these people, uh, they turn on, they get excited, and uh, they um, they go on to do things. And five or I've been doing this for a while now, so five and ten years, uh, and so on. You know, people come back and they went to law school, or they went and started some nonprofit, or they went and did. It's just amazing the things that you you don't have to give it no, no idea. The people that I barely remember, you know, and they're just like, well, you said this one thing, and then I went off and did something else. So I guess I better be careful what I say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that that's really one of the positive messages of the film. And, and Chris and Doug, you know, I really want to—I really want to give them a round of applause. Because they did this on their own. We, of course, we consulted with them, uh, but you know, we—they went and did this on their own initiative. They went and got support to do it and raised funds to do it. Um, and we certainly couldn't have done it, uh, you know, on our own. And so we, we certainly thank them. And that's it—we're a collective effort. I think that's one of the big things I like people to remember about Project Censored is that it's a real collective effort, and we appreciate all the help that people want to give us in any way. And uh, this film is great. And there's got to be a combination of um, taking in this re really disturbing reality in a way that's healthy, not, um, you know, kind of uh, op uh, over the top or um, uh, kind of evangelistically. First of all, you've got the confluence of two very strong directions right now. You have the corporatism of American media, you know, five major media outlets that Stan Rather specifically said and Greg Pallas alluded to, have an economic incentive not to report the news. And I don't know you could actually say that that's a uh, willful attempt to delude the American people so much as it is, uh, in fact, uh, all major 
uh, American media outlets have gone through rounds and rounds of, 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 of budget cutting and cutting staff. I mean, the New York Times um, has gone through drastic layoffs with their staff, and they cannot afford to do the kind of investigative reporting that we, we actually need them to do. Um, I actually used to sell into uh, NBC News, and one time, the first time I met with those people, I said, you know, it must be great to be in the news business, and the guy said, stop. We're not in the news business. We're in the advertising business. And so I think we have to be cognizant of that when we, when we talk about this, that we're not talking about necessarily, on the part of the, the news media, a willful attempt to, to, to delude the American people. So that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is that, is that I, I'm afraid I might be misquoting him, but I think someone once told me that Henry Kissinger once said, how did you, how did you guys possibly get away with things like the, the Vietnam War, and how did we get away with all these other wars when there's so much evidence that uh, the reason for going to war is, is uh, false? You know? And I believe it was Henry Kissinger, or it might have been someone else, uh, another mental maniac like him, who said, the reason we can get away with it is because the American people don't care and they don't read. So, so part of the problem is that when you're overwhelmed, as we are as a society, with so much information, when there's information overload, Having someone who can actually dissect that information and package it up for you so you can get it to sound bites in the half hour that you have to watch the news after you have been working all day long is incredibly difficult. And what what America, what American news media plays to is they play to the fact that Americans do not have the time, that they we're so compressed and we're so overwhelmed with emails and, you know, and, and, and advertisements and things like that. that. The number of advertisements that appear on regular media right now is something, something like 25 times what it was in your so, so there, those are two things that I think you know are, are, are issues that we have to kind of be cognizant of and have to manage. But the question that I have for you is: Is this really the problem? Is, is it really the problem that that that, uh, that uh, we have self censorship in the United States? I've, I've actually lived outside the country a lot. I've lived in Central America. I've lived in Asia, and I, I can tell you that actually the, the, the quality of the news that you get in places like China is more in depth and more. Uh, Balanced than we in the United States right now. Um, you know, for those of you you know who follow KPFA and look at you know listen to news reports uh, about the deep state and have read, done any reading on the CIA's um, uh, influence, direct influence on CNN, um, and it, you know consistent with what I just said about the uh, great callous in the packaging of news, the, the creation of news, the CIA actually now creates news stories that they sell to American media because they do not have the bandwidth to go out and get stories on Iraq or other places. So the CIA said, well, we'll give you a story. And so it's cheaper for news media to actually buy the stuff from the American government and use it as news. And it's done in the same way. There's a, there's a new thing right now called, um, I think, uh, uh, context essential, context uh, advertising, in which advertisers are actually showed up on your internet as if it's news. And you can't tell what they're looking at. And so the same way the CIA and, the, and other parts of the government will actually take uh, their version of the news and package them up in a way that's favorable to the US government. It's propaganda. Yeah. So my question to you guys is, is the issue really censorship, or is the issue really that we're dealing with a deep state? The deep state is propaganda, and the deep state propaganda is censorship. So I don't see necessarily a disconnect between those. And we've long covered Peter Dale Scott and deep state politic issues. And uh, the project that you're talking about originally was, was titled Operation Mockingbird from the late 50s and 1960s when it was unearthed at the church committee hearings in the mid-70s after Watergate, which the CIA actually also was likely in on because they didn't think Dick Nixon was right wing enough. Uh, but that's the story. You don't, you don't really get to hear that story a lot either. Um, but the CIA has long been at these issues and at these affairs, and this is the deep state issue. Uh, this is the deep state writ large. The government we don't see. That actually started to get a little more attention this last year. It was one of our stories in the 2015 book when Bill Moyers got a hold of a former congressional staffer named Mike Lofgren. You might know this. Um, Lofgren was a Republican staffer. It made it very interesting, right? Because for years, you know, the people talking about deep state issues or deep politics and deep events were usually people on the left, right? And Peter Dale Scott, prime among them. Uh, but Lofgren was talking about it from the Republican Party standpoint. He basically said, these people don't run the show. There's people that call the shots that you don't, you don't even know their names. You don't see what happens. You don't know who's writing the bills. You don't know what's going on. 
Um, and that actually started to get a little bit of traction on PBS, and Lofgren's finishing a book about it now. So I'm actually interested in seeing his take on it as a former Republican staffer. Um, but what you said, in fact, it's better than the CIA selling stories to the US media. They, not only did they give them to the news media, they actually had plants working in the stations that they fed the stories to so it looked like they were actual news stories. Oh. CNN, and you mentioned CNN because, again, about a decade ago, they got busted with two interns working in their newsroom that were that came from the CIA. Oh. Right? And, and when, it, when, it, when, it, when they got outed is the fact that they had these guys working there as interns from the CIA, they were just like, well, we didn't know. And then they said, well, what, what, why is this a big deal? Um, and that level of, you know, I can't say it's ignorance, really. I mean, I guess it's ignorance on a different level. Um, but to, to act as if that no one would notice or no one would care is, I think, more toward your other statement, right? Which is that how do we get people to understand what's going on when, when they don't have the agency to pay enough attention or to find out information on their own? If you take a look at the Pew surveys of the people tuning into things like cable news broadcasts, the ratings on cable news have been going down and down and down, and people have been turning it off and off and off over the last several years, uh, which we think is a good thing. Um, but what are they doing instead? I'm sorry. Well, most under the about five percent of people under the age of uh, let's see, under the age of thirty, about five percent of those people, only about five percent of them read newspaper. Uh, of any one consistent source routinely given by people under the age of thirty, where when they say where they get their news from, they say the Daily Show and the Colbert Report. About twenty-five percent of them consistently list that as a place. So if you're openly admitting that you're going to the late night corporate court jesters for news and information, which by the way, it's true. If anybody who's watched those programs knows that those, those shows often are more hard hitting or ask questions or point out the foibles of people in power, far more than Dan Rather did, um, or certainly far more than Brian Williams did, right? Um, but, and I also think riffing on that Williams thing is that, you know, they're making a big deal out of it, like how this guy, like, well, he's embellished over 11 times and, you know, we're, we're holding him accountable. What they're not saying is how many of these people routinely embellish as a matter of editorial policy. And they're not holding any of the people in power accountable that embellish on a daily basis, including into the war in Iraq. That was all embellished. Judy Miller is back in the news. Right on her mea culpa tour, but not even mea culpa. She's not mea culpa. She's saying I was right, <laughs> and I did my job. And the WMDs are there, and everything. I mean, I mean how could this happen in a, in, in, when we know that the facts exist to totally refute her? Well, I say they happen in a society where people don't know where to turn to information. People have really not practiced honing their critical thinking and analytical skills anywhere near as much as they've honed their skills on things like fantasy football uh, or something else. <laughs> Um, and I mean, that's why we th we're approaching this from an educational standpoint. This film is being shown in schools all around the country, in libraries all around the country, and it's creating these kinds of conversations. Being where we are in the Bay Area, we see how effective new technologies are when they're disruptive. But what I saw in the film was a focus on fighting or taking on corporate media which is very difficult. Um, and what I didn't see was discussion of new and very disruptive technologies, the changes that are occurring. First of all, it's things like social media, Twitter. You look at the effect that social, that social media had in the Arab Spring, right? No, no mention of that. Um, secondly, network neutrality. What the network neutrality is doing is it's changing the world Right now, what we have is push content to the corporate. You, know, you have X number of channels, but if the safety is pushed on every one of the channels, we're moving to a world of pull. It means you pick what you want to see, right? So your problem is not going forward what people are forced to watch. It's what they choose to watch, and how do you make them aware that something else is out there? That's really the issue, and I didn't hear that discussed. You mentioned not offering kind of solutions to where to find other, but there was a whole chapter where we talked about alternative and where to get it. I think the most inspiring part of the film that everyone needs to take away is these students. Right now what we're doing is, I don't know if we've talked about this yet, but um, each story that is nominated and makes it into the 
the, uh, the Almanac, the Project Sensor Book, could be its own power documentary, right? I mean, obviously, this is a great source. Any documentary filmmakers out there, pick up a book, and you got yourself 25 stories every year to choose from that each can be their own documentary. Well, so taking that idea, and uh, uh, an incredible professor, a teacher from uh, the JC, uh, uh, working at the Petaluma campus here, came to one of our showings with his class, and we started talking, and I said, what did you bring your old class for? And I said, well, we studied critical, critical analysis of media. And we're also multimedia, so we have the equipment where we take stories and make them into films. And I said, well, we've been talking about for the past year if we could get a class that would actually take the stories and dissect them down into two to three minute short documentaries. So I'm, I'm proud to say right now, here we've got Kyle Williams from the class oh, at yeah. the JC. He's doing one of those stories. This whole class, they are like incredible. I've been going each uh, past couple Mondays to see them and talk to them and look at their scripts. And so they're taking the stories and making them into these short documentaries that we can now post on Facebook, post on YouTube, post on Project Sensor. Because that is it, man. We gotta get it quick side by who said that? Like get that message out. Easily digestible, get it. Because I love democracy now too. But Amy can put me to sleep sometimes, man. I'm like, come on, Amy, let's get a little, a little razzle dazzle going here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's my point on those kind of things. This is Doug. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks again for coming out, Doug Hacker. Um, to address your question, a big part of the reason we did this film was, well, I was so inspired because when I went through Project Censored again, I kind of had my head in the clouds and didn't realize that there was an alternative media. And, um, you know, Dr. Peter Phillips was, um, an amazing teacher and really opened my eyes to you know, the corporate media structure. So we did this film really to not just talk about that debate of um, you know, the corporate media, we know it exists, but we really wanted to shine a light on Project Censored and what they've been doing now for you know, nearly four decades. I mean, it's really incredible. I mean, when Carl first started, you know, they had a little newsletter and then eventually it morphed into a book that they started you know, in the mid-90s, early to mid-90s. Um, and now they've got you know the radio show and other campuses and the movie. So again, all, the reason we did the film was to shine a light on Project Censor, also shine a light on the issue that exists that our corporate media structure um, is harming our society. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Whether it's for capital, uh, capitalistic nature or whether it's to grab more power, wealth, um, it really doesn't matter. It's it's damaging. And you've got ex um, corporate media people like Dan Rather who are coming out and saying this. And, and there's others like him. Phil Donahue, um, Bob Jimenez used to be a local anchor, uh, Caro and TV uh, Channel 4 here in the Bay Area. He's down in Southern California with his wife now. Um, I mean, the gentleman's incredible. You, you, you heard some of this stuff. And we have so much, like Chris said, we have so much footage. I mean, we could have easily had a 40 hour documentary. <laughs> Um, but that's not how you know films are made. And by the way, Mike Fisher is another cousin connection. He's he grew up in Petaluma. Uh, he was our editor, and we kind of stumbled upon him by chance too, which is pretty interesting. But um, so again, our you know our film is to shine a light on Project Censor, the good that they've been doing and continue to do. Um, and also, like Chris and Mickey said, I mean, the students are so important because you've got to grasp them at a, a younger age so that they can start using these critical thinking skills and learning about media, um, exactly what the education is all about, learning about what the media is and how to use it. Um, and we're not saying that everything in our film is going to resonate with everybody, but we hope that we could have kept it you know, simple enough to explain what Project Centered is, what they've been doing, and that we do have a problem with our, our corporate media structure. I think the other thing too is that it's not possible to put all the work from 1976 to the present in a one-hour film. And that's challenging enough just to do the job that, that was done. And that's why I just refer people to the work that's in, in the books. And they're in the libraries, and we have the books, and I routinely make the books available for very inexpensively, in fact, give away many of them. Um, because a lot of the, th all the things that I'm hearing here this evening are things that we have addressed. The push-pull problem, and phenomenon, I think, is among the most significant paradigm shifts in information delivery that we've seen in the last decade. And the one thing that we are specifically focusing on, particularly when you talk about people choosing their own source, their own information, 
really the one thing we have, coupling, and I wish the other gentleman wouldn't have left so we could have continued to have a, a, at least a dialogue, um, was that we're, we're trying to create this, it's called a critical media literacy center and a critical media literacy project associated with project sensor and curriculum and pedagogy. And we're working with over 20 colleges now and we got several others interested where the core of it is to teach people media literacy in a digital age. And that's about as close as I can come to saying what we're doing about the, the pull factor. We're trying, we're not necessarily telling people where to go or what to read, although we'll certainly provide various examples of things that we think fit a, a model of sourced, tr transparently sourced, uh, journalism. We also talk about problems of, of an objectivity and objectivity bias. We don't really think objectivity exists in the real world, though it's certainly something nice to try to live up to. Um, but uh, again, our angle on this stuff has really been more in terms of education. And in terms of the other gentleman saying, well, we need to package this, we need to package this. Um, quite frankly, I think the consumer culture of packaging has been part of the problem that's been dumbing yeah, us down. Yeah, yeah. And so we're kind of like, we're really kind of split between, okay, this is the culture we live in and we need to quote unquote deal and serve it in some capacity for the better. And on the other hand, we need to try to flip that culture back over into a way that realizes that you can't just click a button and have the truth delivered to you. Yeah. The sensation in terms of, you know, the people tuning into her was on YouTube and on Twitter, and that's Abby Martin. From, she had a show on Russia Today called Breaking the Set, and Abby's one of our board members. Mm -hmm. Abby interned with us and worked with us on the radio, and then Abby went and had her own show on Russia Today for three years. Uh, and got a lot of crap for it, of course, because she had to go work for a foreign government's media corporate company to like say half the things she said. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting. You go and check out Abby's accounts and check out how many people have watched Abby's work you know, almost all of it is identical to the stories that we've been covering for years. And she has like 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 times more people checking it out, even though it's the same information, right? Because yeah. they're yeah. places, yeah. right? And we're, we're actually, you know, some people have, you know, uh, come to us. Um, I'm in my 40s, right? And some people, and Peter's in his 60s, and Carl just passed on when he was 85. Um, but you know, some people come to us and they say, why well, doesn't that make you angry? Uh, you know, you know, she's getting all this attention. I'm like, no, I, I'm thrilled to death, man. I'm like, it's, thank God that somebody is paying attention to, to these people that are telling these stories. And I, I think you're right. Um, but I also noted that when you were talking about the Twitter feed, again, it goes right back to what you were saying about how the Twitter feed is what you choose. The Twitter feed is what you choose. Well, I mean, I choose lots of stuff on my Twitter feed, like including a bunch of stuff I don't like or agree with necessarily. But, you know, I don't know if that's the policy that other people do use or have. Um, and I think if you do select stuff that you know is uh, generally factually supportable and generally trustworthy because you built a relationship with a particular source over time, then I think that's great. I think that that's what's off missing. That's certainly what's missing from corporate media is diversity and, and uh, viewpoints. And that's what tends to be missing in the social media universe. It's not that the diversity of viewpoints isn't there, it's that people get to select it out. The American people are aware of a lot of things regardless of what the media feeds them. It's not the issue, the issue is leadership. It's the issue of people willing to do things. Nixon had a term for it, it's called a silent majority. And for the most part, people are silent on most things. They don't do things. Right? And, and this vision of the corporations as being some megalith. Salesforce.com changed the law in Indiana. Basically, one person, the CEO, right? Maybe the targets for information shouldn't be the mass population because I think you're wasting your time. Maybe it's people who are actually capable and willing to do things. And that there are channels, their channels, and Twitter certainly one of them, maybe others, Politico, other places where people go to learn things that might be more productive.
Well, tr trying to raise awareness and, and communicate with people and collectively work to change how these things operate is my job. Uh, would it be easier if I just taught something else that was less controversial? Probably. Would I maybe even make a lot more money and sell more books if I wrote about something else? Yeah. But I don't really see how I could do that knowing what I know about how things are and how they really could, how they are in some sort of, but how they really could be in broader arenas. And I think that, again, back to your selective effort, I think if we all work together and we all share this information, and we work across generations, across gender, color lines, country lines, etc. And we just focus on humanity. I really think that we have power that the corporations only dream of. If only we use it.